This tutorial will tell you what code overrides are and show you how to use them to do more in Framer Web. They allow you to make components more interactive and offer some unique capabilities because they are just snippets of JavaScript or TypeScript in our case. They can be applied to anything on the canvas. This is Coding with Seth. Let's see what we'll be building. This tutorial series is best viewed in the context of Framer Web. If you're on YouTube, use the link in the description to follow along. Throughout the series, we'll be building out some screens you might see in a mobile banking app. We're going to go over the default override template to see what could be achieved before trying out some other cases. We'll take a look at how a simple override could be used to randomize the background color of an icon. Then we'll make an input that has some validation and gives the user feedback by changing the border color. Finally, we'll take a look at how we can create a component that the user can show and hide directly with the click of a button. Let's get started with a brief explanation of what code overrides are. Code overrides are a bit different to code components. They don't dictate the look and functionality all at once, and you can't drag them onto the canvas like you would with a component. Code overrides are overrides for what you can see on the canvas. They're for small pieces of interactivity or customization, but just because they're easy to make and use doesn't mean they aren't powerful. Let's create our first code override and explore the template. To create a code override, when you're in the code editing mode, click create code file. You'll see this modal where you can choose new override and give it a name. If you're starting from scratch, you can create it from the main menu. Navigate down to code and then choose create override. When you create an override, you'll see Framer has populated it with a template. Let's break down what we have in the template and then we can use these overrides. At the bottom of the file, you'll also find a link for learning more about code overrides. This documentation is good for getting started and explains a bit more about how overrides work. Use this as a reference if you ever get stuck. Let's come back to the data instance in a minute. The first override is rotate. It's a simple function that returns an object. This object contains the properties in whatever component we want to attach it to that we want to override. In this case, we're adding an animation to rotate the component 90 degrees over the duration of two seconds. Let's see this in action. Selecting the component we want to attach the override to, in the properties panel, you'll see an override section. Click plus to reveal which file we want to use. We'll choose default overrides, and then select the override you want, rotate. Nothing's changed in the canvas, but if we preview, you'll see the square rotates once. This is where overrides are really powerful. We can use them to add to any component. Let's move on to hover. This one is a little different. We'll apply the hover override and preview it. Rotate simply animate it immediately when previewed. Hover instead defines a scale change within the while hover property. Whenever your mouse is over the component with this override, the properties inside while hover will be applied. When the mouse is over the component, it smoothly scales up, and when the mouse leaves, it scales back to its original size. Random color is the final override in the template. It combines the two previous concepts. When clicking on the component, we want to change the color. To animate the background color of the component, we tell Framer to animate the background. Each time we click, a new random color is generated and stored in the data object with the key background. I cover using data in more depth in another video. This isn't an override by itself, but it's a useful utility you'll often find yourself using to make your overrides more powerful. It can be used in a similar way to React's set state. Let's take what we've learned and apply it to a simple example. We have a series of squares with icons and the same background color. Let's make an override to give each square a random background color. We start by importing override and color from Framer. Then we need to create the override. We'll export a function called random color and it returns the type override. We'll start off with something simple first so we can get the hang of it. Let's make the override return a background color of red. When we apply it to each of these squares, we should see the color change once we open the preview. Let's apply the same override to all our squares. Inside the function body, let's create a variable called random color. We can use the color.random function to generate a random color object call dot to value to get the hex color we can use. Now for the actual overriding. We simply set the background color to random color. As before, there's no change in the editor. 
A random color will be chosen when we preview. Every time you refresh the preview, a new color will be chosen. So there's a toy example out of the way, but how could we use it for our banking app? Let's take a look at a common use case that we can use to breathe some life into our prototype. This is our money sending screen. When we'd like to send some money to a friend to pay them back, we can type a number in the input here, but we could type anything. There's no validation, no feedback to tell the user that the field needs to be changed. We'll create some overrides to change the border color of our input. First, let's create the input validation override. We need to store whether the field is valid or not in a data instance. So how do we go about changing the border color? This input component is a code component that's part of the frame and default components. In the props, you'll see a focus color property control. In handoff mode, we can see the prop name too, so we know that focus color is what we need to change. In input validation override, you'll see is all numbers. This helper function returns true if there are only numbers and decimal points in the input. We'll use an onChange handler in order to determine if the value is changed. When it has, we'll set data.isInputValid to the value of isAllNumbers. So, if there are only numbers, it will return true. If there are any letters, it will return false. And we'll use this to drive the focus color. When we type a number, the border is green. But if there's a letter, we see a red border, and this updates reactively as the user types. This is much better, but the send money button is still very inviting, even if the input is in an invalid state. We'll create a new send money button override, which will change the property of the button. We can see this button has a disabled property. So we'll take advantage of it to disable the button when the input is invalid and enable it when there's a number in there. And then we have it, a complex interaction all driven by a single variable. Let's take a look at one more example. This time, we're going to make a small set of overrides for a view. We're going to allow the user to hide or show their transaction history. First, we'll import override and data from frame. Then we'll create a data instance. Just like we did before, we'll use it to store whether the history has been hidden or not. Now we'll work on the toggle itself. This toggle control has a special on toggle handler which we can make use of. When the toggle changes, we want to store this in our data instance. Now we can toggle from a data perspective. Let's use is showing history to set the opacity of our history frame. Let's connect the overrides and see how it looks. We'll add our toggle history override to the toggle component. Then connect toggle visibility on history to the frame containing the history title and children. If we preview it, we can see it works, but there is an empty void where the history once was. Let's move the toggle up to the top of the page if the history is hidden. We can't have multiple overrides on the same component, so how do we go about doing this? Let's nest the title and the toggle history label in a new frame and add an override to that instead. We'll create the toggle action placement override to change the Y position of this new frame. If the history is visible, it should stay where it is, but if it's hidden, we want to shift it up about the same size as the frame and a little bit of padding. Trying it out, the toggle moves up, closing the void, perfect. This concludes exploring overrides for enriching your prototypes in Framer Web. We've covered what overrides are and how you can combine them to create more complex behavior in your prototype. Thanks for watching. In the next video, breathe life into prototypes with code overrides. We'll see how we can tweak our existing code overrides to create animation and see how we can apply overrides in new scenarios to make our prototypes feel more like real products.
Until next time, this has been Coding with Seth.